work um, that I've been doing with Mark Tibber and Pete Betts primarily. Um, so, to give you a little overview, uh, I'm going to tell you how we as psychophysicists at least consider visual noise and some of the techniques we use for studying it. And then, in the second half of the talk, I'll talk about particularly the use of noise in studying integration and integration deficits in clinical populations. Um, so, okay. So noise is, within psychophysics there are lots of different paradigms for studying noise. I'm really going to focus on one paradigm, okay? Um, and that is what's known as equivalent noise. And if you walk away with one thing today from my talk, you know, I would like you, if you don't know anything about equivalent noise, to kind of get a basic grasp of what we're talking about, and to absorb the idea that we do now have good methods for measuring our clinical populations. So the basic idea goes back to the work of Horace Barlow in the 1950s. He, he termed something called dark noise. The question that he was asking was, what limits your vision at low light levels? Okay? Now, if you imagine trying to recognize something on a moonlit night, one thing that will limit it will just be the signal strength. That would be the moon going behind trees. When you get right down to very, very low light levels, it's even limited by things like fluctuations in the number of quantum that are being absorbed by your eye. So, that's one limit, okay, logically. The other limit is due to random fluctuations in the operation of components of the visual system. And that collectively is what we as psychophysicists think of as noise. It's that uncertainty associated with the operation of different components of the visual system. Now, Barlow came up with the quite spectacular insight, in my view, that noise acts like light. Okay. So the way that he said it was useful to think about detection, if you're trying to see something in the dark, you're not just trying to tell something from nothing. What you're trying to do is distinguish a weak signal from a background of spurious signals. Okay. So his idea was, this has to work, the projector's a little bit dark, but when you're comparing two dark things, actually what you experience is something more like two kind of speckly things, things with kind of random fluctuations in them. This is a very useful insight, but particularly so because Barlow also gave us a way of measuring that uncertainty, that noise. Okay, the paradigm he came up with is um, equivalent noise. He adapted a technique called equivalent noise. So the idea is, what we're going to do is we're going to measure the light level that interferes with your performance to the same extent as the noise that's already in the system. So the way it works is, um, this would be your standard discrimination. This is supposed to be a little bit lighter than this. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to measure how much extra light we need to add for you to reliably tell the difference. Okay? It's called an increment threshold. Now, if we do that against the background of no light, that's a regular detection experiment. You're just saying if there's something there. But that's the point here. And the lower you are on this graph, the better your performance. And what you find is that as you start increasing the background luminance, nothing happens. Performance is flat. And then there's a point as you get to a critical limit where your performance starts to go up. And at very high light levels, it's very hard to make these discriminations. From this graph, you can infer a point, which is known as the dark noise, which is the background luminance level that basically starts to interfere with your perception. So that is the level of light that is in some sense equivalent to the internal uncertainty or noise in the system. Okay? Is that okay, basically? Because I'm going to say this, in about four different ways, okay, <laughs> in different domains, but that's the basic idea, okay? Now Barlow himself, and I, as I said, I do think this is a, maybe an underappreciated how clever this insight is. He, he got the idea from um, engineering. Um, this is just a terrible thing for a vision science. <laughs> <laughs> put a background like that up, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so uh, you, you know that um, you know that if you're buying an amplifier, okay, for your hi-fi system, amplifiers aren't perfect. And what they do is they add noise, okay. So the question is, how do you best evaluate your amplifier before you buy it? Well, the way that engineers evaluate amplifiers is they take their amplifier and they put some noise into it with a certain amplitude, okay, of a known amplitude. It's a calibrated noise source. They play the noise through the amplifier, and they stick a microphone on the speaker, and they measure how much noise comes out. Then they play the same game as Barlow did before. They make those measurements, and they fit with this curve here, and they measure the amount of noise they add until they start seeing a rise in the output of the system. Okay? 
So, to reiterate, equivalent noise, and we call this external noise, the noise, the, the, the way that you challenge the system, the uncertainty that you put on the signal is called external noise. Equivalent noise is the external noise level that is equivalent to the system noise. That's why it's called equivalent noise. It's also variously called internal noise. Okay, um, as I've said, dark noise before, but basically these all amount to the same thing. Now, the reason we can fit a line to this is that um, we can exploit a, a property, a mathematical property, um, which is, you can kind of ignore this bit, okay, if you really just want to get the overview part of it, but the basic idea is that the way we characterize noise usually is through some measure of variance, okay? Um, so, when we measure the output, we're kind of measuring variance. The noise that we add is measured in terms of variance, it's the standard deviation uh, of the signal or the squared, and the, uh, so that's the noise we add, and the internal noise can also be expressed as variance. So this solid line thing is, is just the sum of an internal and an external noise signal to predict this. This is basically a straight line on log axis. Okay, so that's all very well, but luminance for amplifiers. <coughs> we know that the currency of spatial vision, though, is not luminance, and it's, um, it, it's basically contrast. Okay? Spatial vision cares about contrast. And it's to Dennis Pelly's credit that he took this idea from, uh, from Barlow and he applied it to contrast. And the way he did that was by using stimuli like this, with this little grating, it's called a Gabor, and it's presented in white noise, just random pixels. And the experiment that Pelly did is sort of embodied in this figure here by demonstration. So he manipulated <coughs> the contrast of this white noise background, okay, and he saw how much signal you had to add, going from very high to very low, to be able to detect that there were some stripes there. So for most people here, hopefully, you'll be seeing the point at which you just see the stripes, hopefully traces something a little bit like this, that about right, okay? Once again, same game, right? This is the same equivalent noise function. The game that he played was to measure that the game to the noise contrast, he measured how much signal he needed here, okay? And he did that, this is for the signal that you saw, this is at high light levels, but he did the same thing with very dark stimuli. There's a little Gabor in there, but it's very dark. And if you do that, you can measure, once again, the equivalent noise, the amount of contrast you have to put into this background before you start affecting performance. And if you do that, they're shifted. Okay? So for the high light levels, the noise levels are quite low, and at low light levels, they're quite high. They're shifted up here. What Pelly did in his PhD um, was to go through a lot of experiments and show that these equivalent noise levels, the shifts that you see, are broadly consistent with the visual system absorbing somewhere between 1%, these are predictions from lots of experiments, um, and at different light levels. Um, this is for 1% and this is for 10% absorption of photons. So he showed that basically all of the really, really early noise in the visual system um, uh, a lot of it can be accounted for photon absorption between these, in this range. Everything else must be neural. Okay? So he also pointed out a nice point, which was that this is a characteristic of a well-designed system. Good, well, good, good, good electronics as well are limited by their early noise. Okay? Because that means that all the other components, which introduce noise in their own right, have been set, their gains have been set, so they're not overwhelming all that early noise, which is just kind of inevitable. Okay? So it's good design. Phew. So, what about neural noise? Well, the basic idea here is that neurons don't always give the same response to the same input. Okay? Um, that's called response variability. Indeed, they don't always give the same response to no input. That's called spontaneous activity. So, we know that this operates on many spatial and temporal scales, and there are lots and lots of sources. Okay? Probably the main one is called synaptic bombardment because neurons are getting input from lots of other neurons. We can't really differentiate between all those flavors of, uh, of uh, the sources of noise, but there are, I think, a couple of concepts that, that are useful for behavior experiments. The first idea is, is of additive noise, and that is that um, if you've got a neuron that's making spikes and it cares about the contrast of the signal, okay, how, um, how strong those gabors are, then what you typically see is their activity will rise with contrast. But if you look at the variability in their responses, um, what you'll find is that at low uh, contrast levels, some neurons generate very variable activity, and at high, it's much less so. That is the characteristic of what's called additive noise. Okay? Now remember, this is log-log axes. That's why the error bars are bigger down here. Okay? On the other hand, 
There's a source of neural noise, uh, noise known as multiplicative or Poisson noise. And the signature of that is that the more active a neuron becomes, the more variable its response is. So it's error bar scale with the amount of activity. That on log log axes generates these constant error bars. Now the reason that these are broadly useful ideas to us are that if we go back to the experiment I've already shown you, the Pelly experiment, and we think about the contrast of the signal, and we think about how much contrast you need to add, one way you can think about this is by thinking, okay, these low noise, levels, these um, low contrast levels, really what's going on is that the additive noise is going to dominate. Okay? These very, very low signal levels, there's very few spikes being generated, so any additive noise will limit your precision. At high noise levels, it's going to be multiplicative noise. Okay? Now, these very, very high noise levels, you're not worried about this stuff, it's just being swamped. Okay? It's going to be multiplicative noise. And just as an aside, What's really going on here, multiplicative noise is what determines a lot of psychophysical performance. So Weber's law, to remind you, is just that, that when you get people to make a discrimination around a particular signal strength, the stronger the signal, the more variable their, their, their response. So the variable scales with the mean. So you can kind of see how, if you were trying to read off weight or luminance or contrast, that this kind of a coding scheme, where the error bars scaled with the signal, would allow you to explain something like Weber's that's all I'm going to say about the low-level stuff. I want to move on to integration now and how these kinds of paradigms can be applied to look at other things. So we know that neurons in the primary visual cortex are these, or everywhere in the visual um, stream have receptive fields. It's a part of the space, of space that they care about and they're going to respond to. That means that all cortical processing in some way is, must be to do with a process we just call local-to-global -global integration. But how do you put that stuff together? for useful percepts, or useful information about the world. And there's a reasonable amount of clinical interest in this area. The reasons that we were trying to figure out yesterday, perhaps we can talk about, but I, I think that, broadly speaking, it's because these visual integration deficits can be mapped onto syndromes of broader integration deficits. I'm thinking about in, in things like schizophrenia. There's also this uh, tempting idea of mapping things onto magnum parvo pathways, so people have thought a lot about motion. Um, I'm going to focus on motion integration. This is my um, standard demo of why you need motion integration. Um, this should both appear the same, pairs of dots twitching back and forth. Um, if I just um, introduce one feature, these squares here, your percept drastically changes. Okay? You don't see two things moving independently, hopefully you now see a square moving around. Motion is exactly the same, but to disambiguate these two cases, you've had to bind together these motion signals in order to, to tell what's going on underneath. So we have lots of mechanisms that could do this stuff for us in primary visual areas. Later visual areas like MT have to put all this stuff together. Now the way that we've done that in the past have been to use paradigms like motion coherence. So probably most people here are familiar with this. This is a crossover area between psychophysics and clinical. And I'll just remind you, the basic idea is you have um, uh, some signal dots. Here they're all moving to the right. There's some proportion of them that have been replaced with random motion. Okay? So if it gets harder, the, the, the more dots you replace. And you basically figure out an amount, might be about 20%, that you need to reliably tell that this is moving left or right. Okay? Now I've um, pointed out before that this is a flawed measure for measuring integration. The basic idea is, the assumption is that to do, um, these are signal dots in red here, blues, noise. The basic idea is that to perform this task, the assumption is that somehow you pull over some subset of these things. And the idea is that when you're bad at it, maybe like an autism, then it could be because you're just using less of them, okay? However, there are lots of other reasons you could be bad at this task. And uh, one is, you just might not be very good at telling the individual motions, okay? So we would call this local noise, okay? And we would probably call this undersampling or something like that, okay? Now, part of the reason that it's been, I think, so difficult to, to dig into these sorts of measurements and figure out what's going on is, because there is no clear optimal strategy for doing this task. What do you really tell people to do here? Do you tell them to look at all the dots? Do you tell them to try and look at the ones that are moving left and right and ignore the other ones? Personally, I'm not comfortable with tasks where I can't specify to the, the observer exactly what I want them to do. Okay? So I'm going to give you an alternative <coughs> you can. And that's um, a technique uh, called motion averaging. Now, the task here is what we're going to do with this. Um, we've got three um, stimuli here. 
what we're going to try and measure is the smallest change in direction from, in this case, vertical, that people can reliably distinguish. Okay. Now, the difference here is all the dots are single dots. It is in your best interest to try and average all the directions together to make your judgment. And that is optimal, and that also allows us to use something called an ideal observer, that is a machine that will do the same thing and will allow us to characterize your performance in reference to it. So the thing that's changed here is just the range of directions that are present. Here they're all moving basically in the same direction, which should be fairly easy. Here they're moving with a broad range of directions, and the discrimination is much harder, I hope you'll agree. Okay? So even at about 32 degrees, it's really quite hard to tell that this isn't just moving vertically upwards. Okay. That's the game we're going to play. So now, what I'm going to try and do is to bring those two ideas together. Okay? How can we analyze these kinds of averaging tasks using the kind of noise analysis I've told you about repeatedly already? So Sorry, did you tell, do you tell them to not fixate? Why do they fixate? Sorry, they do fixate. They fixate centrally. Um, well, they fixate worse and Condition three of those in the first one. Uh, okay. I think Catherine's in the sense of data show. We do okay. when we track okay. fixation, it's okay. not significant. Okay. So here's the hard slide, and this is but this is the, the I'll take a little time on it. I'll take about three minutes on it. <laughs> and uh, and explain what's going on. So the basic idea is this here's the stimulus. Okay, here it is, it's a little bit offset to the left. And we assume that the observer strategy is to sample some of these elements. Uh, so n, and each of them will have a particular precision, which we'll call sigma n. So that is going to be our uncertainty on each direction. So here's the results of our experiment. We change the range of directions, and we got some data that look like this, which should be familiar to you by now. As we add small amounts of directional range, no effect, and then things go up. Okay, so here's the good part. We can take the model that we had before, and adapt it to make specific predictions of performance. So this is the predicted pressure, <coughs> basically. What we've got here are the number of samples that we observe as averaging. Here is the noise that we added, that's the direction of range, and this is their internal uncertainty on each direction. This model allows us to decompose their performance into how many samples they're averaging and how precise each sample is. Or, if you like, internal noise, and something like sampling, or divided by the total number of elements, that would be efficiency. Okay? So we can read off the data here. Now the nice thing about this is, it doesn't matter how they're doing it, actually. You can be agnostic about their strategy. This tells us effectively how many samples they're averaging. Okay? It tells us whatever strategy they're using is effectively averaging n samples. Okay? And it's useful. Okay? We've used it to do some things that are interesting in the orientation domain we've shown that crowding for example when you have clutter in the periphery it makes you uncertain about individual elements whereas attention if you just distract people then they become less efficient they use they use less elements and there was a kind of debate about whether crowding was attention and we showed you could dissociate them so it's useful the downside of equivalent noise is it's slow okay you have to make lots and lots of measurements each of these remember we're measuring the smallest offset you can reliably discriminate okay so here's the, um, the, an idea that I think is going to be coming up uh, in a couple of other talks today that I just put out and uh, sort of go through. So we developed something called rapid equivalent noise. Um, so the idea here is that if you think about it, this is a two-parameter fit. Okay, you have the, the, the noise here, the direction range, and their threshold. Um, you only really need two thresholds to, to fit that function. Okay, so one of them is easy to figure out. The point that will best constrain the function at this end, the most informative threshold, will be with zero noise. Okay? That should be uncontroversial. Okay? The question is, how do you pick the other thresholds? Because there's lots of ways to get this wrong. If you pick, if you're only going to pick one point, if you pick too low, you won't characterize the function properly because you won't have overcome their internal or equivalent noise. If you pick too high, they can't do it. Okay? This is a point where they're just, you're not going to be able to measure a reliable offset. The trick is how you pick that sweet point there. So, sorry, just to say, this is the zero noise condition. Here, this is the standard thing. Maybe this would be Quest running, okay? You give you different offsets to determine the minimum amount you need. So here's what we came up, came up with as a way to solve that. Now, rather than measuring the directional offset required, we get people to do a coarse direction discrimination, left or right in this case, 
But rather than manipulating the offset as here, we manipulate the amount of noise. So the idea is, if you like, normally we're trying to bracket an equivalent noise function by all these different thresholds in this direction. What we're going to do now is only do that once, and then we're going to bracket the noise from the other direction. So, and what we found is, so we're calling this noise tolerance. So as you can see here, for example, this is fairly easy. I'm showing you here this is the range of directions for the present. It's easy when it's low. As it increases, it gets harder and harder until it kind of breaks down here to very hard to set. So we've run a staircase on this as well, and we just figure out how much noise you need to do this maximal discrimination, if you like. Do people get that? Is that broadly? Yeah. This looks a lot more motion coherent, right? but the difference is all of the dots are single dots. That's the straight. Um, just one minute to say, the, uh, uh, these are some simulations, it, we need, you need about a third of the trials. We've been running this with, um, with PBEX, we've been doing this on glaucoma to measure um, motion signals, which is traditionally done with um, sort of motion um, uh, coherence perimeter. Final um, thing to say, I'm not going to talk about this, but one thing, one paradigm, these are kind of discussion points almost. I mean, one thing that, another way to measure noise rather than these paradigms is we don't expect noise just to affect performance, we expect it to um, affect your consistency. If I just show you the same stimuli over and over again, um, I can break up your performance, the noise that you exhibit, into stuff that's correlated with the stimulus and stuff that's uncorrelated. This is a really useful technique, but it's really hellish to say. And so I, but I do think there's um, space for this kind of technique with clinical populations. There are problems associated with it. In particular, um, we assume in these paradigms that sensory noise dominates the decision process, that people's strategies and things are negligible. Clearly that's not going to be the case with certain patient populations. Just to sum up, so noise is a ubiquitous feature of the, uh, the visual system, um, but we can assess uh, your limits on integration at least, um, we can divide them up into noise and sampling using these psychophysical methods. And we now have efficient tests suitable for patient assessment. If you are interested in noise, let me just point out the uh, YouTube ECBP Visual Noise Symposium. And the Baker's put a lot of videos up from the CDP if you want to learn more about uh, the kind of state of the art work on, on noise.